It is my pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Mike Brickner. Uh, Mike has a background which in, uh, encompasses ACLU leadership and activism, as well as um, having a bachelor's degree in sociology from Hiram College and a master's degree in um, diversity management, which I've never heard before, but certainly something very important in our society, um, from Cleveland State University. Mike has authored reports on the uh, use of provisional, or well, the overuse of provisional ballots in Franklin County, Ohio, uh, voter suppression in Ohio's historically black colleges and universities, and he has fought for voters who were wrongly added to the purge list, um, which of course began this year. Mike previously served for 14 years with the ACLU as the senior policy director there, and uh, he worked on a variety of critical civil liberties events or, or movements. Uh, these campaigns resulted in systemic reforms to enact online voter registration, ensure voters have access to evening and weekend early in-person voting opportunities, and fight the use of uh, prisons for profit, um, something that I really against. And advocate, he's been an advocate for those groups of people who are typically under uh, represented in their voting rights or negated. Um, in his current position as Ohio's executive director of All Voting is Local, Mike works tirelessly to ensure our Ohio uh, elections are conducted fairly. Most of us have very uneventful uh, election days. Uh, after we study the issues and the candidates, we go to our polling place, we announce ourselves to the poll worker, uh, we uh, cast our ballot, and we get our little sticker, and then we leave. However, sometimes between long lines in some places, uh, machine failures have occurred, uh, registration issues have, ar have arisen, attempts to suppress votes, and the threat now of a cyber attack, there is a chance that voters may face hurdles. And uh, Mike's going to talk about some of those and how we can plan for that not to happen as much as possible. Mike's presentation today is entitled Election Protection, How You Can Ensure a Successful Election in Your Community. Mike will teach us the basics of strong and fair election design we will leave with the knowledge of the steps to take to examine the key components of strong and fair elections and to look at Star County's elections with the goal of being supportive and helpful as we look to see what kinds of questions we need to ask and who we need to ask them of. Sorry for ending my preposition. <laughs> and excitement that we welcome Mike Brickner as our speaker today. All right, well thank you so much uh, to Donna for doing all of this uh, planning work. I'm so excited to talk to you all. I will probably move around just a little bit during the presentation. I have to move back to advance my PowerPoint every so often, so you'll see me do that. But um, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you all about how we can make Election Day really work for voters. I think Donna was 100% correct in her uh, assessment of Election Day for many of us, that many of us can go to our polling location, we walk in, we greet our, our uh, poll worker, um, we hand over any of our ID documents, and we're given our ballot, we vote, we put it the machine, it's done, it's over, and we haven't experienced any problems. And the, luckily, that is the experience that um, most voters do have in most years. But we also know that for many other voters, uh, they experience problems uh, frequently. And that when they do experience problems, one, it could threaten their ballot actually being counted. Um, but it can also sort of um, uh, depress them from turning out in the future, right? And that we know that certain communities experience that type of suppression um, a little bit more frequently. 
Um, Donna mentioned a couple of the reports that I've worked on, so I just wanted to give a, a, a brief overview of a couple of them because I think it kind of helps to ground us in this conversation. So uh, Donna mentioned uh, the provisional ballot report that I did in Franklin County. How many people here have heard of provisional ballots before? Okay. Did anybody want to say what they think a provisional ballot is or why you might get a provisional ballot? Uh, over here. Uh, a provisional ballot provides an alternative way for the elections to determine who you are an older voter if there's any question uh, whatsoever in the minds of older voters. Mm -hmm. Anything to add? Well, I was going to say I had to fill one out once because I think I moved and something I didn't get my change of address updated correctly or something. Mm -hmm. um, I do. I did sort of feel like, yeah, like maybe that'll get counted and maybe it won't. Yes. <laughs> That you, you have a serious question because it says provisional and you're filling out all this paperwork and is it, it, am I actually going to have my ballot count? Yeah, my guy voted uh, at a Alliance High School in a, in a primary, uh, trying to vote Democratic primary. And uh, there was a problem and um, I ended up with two detectives and a uniformed police officer in the voting booth with me. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> And following up that, and I was told at that point that filing a provisional ballot um, because the encoder had, instead of giving me a Democratic uh, ballot, had, had made a mistake and had given me a nonpartisan ballot with no, uh, no people on it, and they wouldn't give me a Democratic ballot. Wow. Um, and following up with the state on that, uh, uh, the people there told me that uh, doing a provisional ballot would be useless because it would not be counted. And when I followed up with the state, they said they knew that most poll worker errors occurred uh, during the end of the day when people came from work. Mm -hmm. They had been there all day with no breaks. And in order to call the Board of Elections in Canton from Alliance, uh, to try to resolve this issue, um, the poll workers had to use their own minutes mm -hmm. on their cell phones. Yep. So there were a lot of uh, issues um, at the polling place that day, and I've never voted again at a polling place. So it's early. Yes, yeah. always early. Yeah. Absentee ballot requests. A couple of glasses of wine. <laughs> <laughs> You probably need a drink after that experience in person, though, too. Yeah, and, and we take our time. Uh, we investigate, especially in, in judge races or whatever. Yep, yep, yep. But it's so interesting because you heard his experience when he had this problem at the polling location. And again, when you are a voter who has that experience, you're either going to shift your voting behavior or you might just stop voting altogether. Um, so two of the examples I want to give you, in particular with provisional ballots, is, and we were absolutely right, a provisional ballot is supposed to be that case of last resort, right? Where a voter has shown up and there's some sort of problem, right? Whether they can't be found in the poll books, they don't have the right ID, they showed up to the wrong location, uh, what, what happened? Uh, it, the, the poll book says that maybe they request an absentee ballot earlier, right? That's another reason to get a, a, a provisional ballot. Um, sometimes it also happens because the poll worker's tired. The poll worker has a giant uh, stack of stuff to memorize and maybe forgot that one provision and didn't know what the rules were and mistakenly gave a person a provisional ballot. Um, so two examples I want to give you that, again, I kind of kind of that help to ground this conversation. Uh, the first one is at uh, Central State and Wilberforce University. So those are two uh, historically black colleges and universities in the entire state of Ohio. They're actually two of the, uh, of only a few in the entire Midwest. And so these are, uh, one, Central State is a public university and Wilberforce is a private university. Understand, but they're basically within a few hundred feet of one another in a tiny little town called Wilberforce in Greene County, Ohio, right outside of the um, very uh, conservative, mostly white community. And you have these two uh, colleges that are predominantly uh, uh, black college students. 
Um, so we got contacted after the 2018 election actually by the legal women voters in the greater Dayton area. They had been providing election protection down at Wilberforce and Central State. And they contacted us and they said, we've been doing election protection here for many, many years. And every single year, so many students are casting provisional ballots that we feel like most of the students have just kind of given up and they're not voting anymore. And so I, I, I said, well, that's really concerning. Let me take a look at some of the data and see what's maybe going on down here. So I pulled a lot of the data from the Secretary of State's website. And first of all, when we look at just turnout at Central State University, um, they in 2018, they had a 15% turnout in their precinct. Now, statewide, they had a 55% turnout. So 15% at Central State. Uh, it was the eighth lowest turnout in the entire state of Ohio for precincts. When you look at that 15% who did show up, 45% of those students cast provisional ballots, and half of those ballots were tossed out. And so talking to the central state students, they, you know, many of them are out-of-state students. They didn't know the rules around registration, so they didn't know, oh, I'm registered to vote in Detroit or Chicago or Indianapolis. They didn't know that they had to update their voter registration for Green County. But many of the students said, well, you know, everyone talks about it on campus that we hear it's so hard to vote here, so most people just don't even show up anyway. And then those of us who do, most of us get a provisional ballot and we don't get to vote anyway. And so people had a very negative experience with provisional ballots. And we saw how that negative experience that people had every single year when they walked into a polling location, how that then depressed the turnout year after year after year. I'm going to take you a little bit further north uh, to Franklin County now. So Franklin County is, you know, Columbus, and uh, Columbus has a lot of things in it. Uh, they've got the state capitol, they've got a uh, hockey team, they also have the Ohio State University. <laughs> I, I have to contractually put that V there or else I get in trouble with OSU. Um, but they're a very big county, right? Uh, they cast disproportionately more provisional ballots than any other county in the state of Ohio. Now, if you look at like Franklin and Cuyahoga County, they both make up about 11% of the electorate. But one out of four of every provisional ballot cast in the state of Ohio comes from Franklin County. And they are thrown out disproportionately for reasons that don't make any sense. So two thirds of all the provisional ballots thrown out for a signature mismatch in the state of Ohio come from Franklin County. Two thirds of all of them in the entire state. One out of 10 of every ballot thrown out for uh, a, a voter at the wrong location come from Franklin County, from one county in the entire state of Ohio. When we start to look at the county overall, so it doesn't look so bad if you look if you if you look really far out at the entire county. Only about 1.6% of all ballots in Franklin County are provisional ballots, right? If you look at the entire county. But then you start looking at specific communities. So if you look at uh, black voters in Franklin County, they are two and a half times more likely to cast a provisional ballot than white voters. If you look at low-income voters, they are four times more likely to cast a provisional ballot than uh, 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 higher income voters. And if you look at college students, they are five times more likely to cast a provisional ballot. If you go to the, the Ohio State University and go to the Ohio State University's Ohio Union, which is their student center, one out of 10, every voter who walks through that door casts a provisional ballot and 65% of those ballots are then thrown out. So again, we see how, you know, what happens on election day very, very much impacts voters in a very real way. And so I, I wanted to share those stories because those are just some examples of the problems that we sometimes see uh, that keep people from being able to vote. And so I really want to focus us on how can we as individual advocates help to make election day work for voters. Because again, for many of us who go out there and vote, 
we don't always run into problems, right? Um, we can cast our ballot fairly easily, and we don't run into some of these barriers that have been placed uh, in front of college students or low-income people or people of color. And so we have the ability to sort of reach down and help other people up, right? And so we're going to focus on some of those ways to do it. Now, talking to Donna before this uh, uh, program started, we had a whole laundry list of things to talk about. So we are going to address all of those things. I also want to make clear, though, that if there's something that you are like dying to know about in terms of elections, I am more than happy to address them. But here's what's on the agenda for today. So first of all, I'm going to give myself a little bit more of an introduction, tell you a little bit more about All Voting is Local and some of the work that um, I've done. We're going to talk about poll workers. We're going to talk about polling location changes. We are going to uh, talk about any kind of new equipment that you might uh, encounter when you go to vote and what kind of equipment is here in Stark County in particular. Uh, we're going to talk about this thing called election administration plans. These are really, really important, and the League of Women Voters actually gets like the most credit for putting these into place, so we're going to talk about what those are and why they're so important. We're going to talk about election protection, how that works and why it is important, and then how each of you can help. All right? Um, sound good? All right, good. So, a little bit more about myself and all voting as local. So, uh, previously I did work for the ACLU for 14 years, um, and there I did a whole range of work um, around voting and criminal justice, and I really saw firsthand almost every single election how these like little rules would impact people. Um, uh, one story I'd love to tell is, um, so I started working at the ACLU in 2004. Someone was, you were telling me you were an election protection volunteer in 2004, right? So that's when I started at the ACLU. I was a little baby field organizer. I had to go down to Cincinnati and Dayton, and I was organizing people. Um, and I started in like June or July of that year, so it was right as the presidential election was heating up. And back then we had a Secretary of State, uh, uh, Ken Blackwell. Anybody remember Ken Blackwell? Oh yeah. <laughs> so I remember, you know, I kind of came in thinking, well, voting is so easy and everyone, I, I don't know why people are saying it's so hard for some people, and, you know, my parents always did it. I was able to do it when I was in college. I just requested an absentee ballot from home and they mailed it to me. I don't, I don't know, understand what the problem is. And I remember within two weeks of me joining the ACLU, uh, Secretary Blackwell came out with the now infamous directive where he said anybody who turns in voter registration forms on the wrong weight of paper, those voter registration forms are going to toss out, right? Now, what possible reason could there be to throw out voter registration forms that are delivered on a different weight of paper? I can't think of any, right? They can be processed, they're, they're, everything is still filled out correctly, right? But it was a way to disenfranchise certain voters because one of the things that people forget is back in 2004, that was when a group called ACORN was still around, which did a lot of voter registration. And they specifically did voter registration in uh, 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 public housing buildings. And so they were doing voter registration in Cleveland and Columbus and Cincinnati in these public housing buildings. And they were using a different way to paper because it was a little bit cheaper. And so it was a way to throw out all thousands and thousands and thousands of these voter registration forms. Now people fought Secretary Blackwell back on that, but it was a good reminder of how we oftentimes use technicalities to keep people from the ballot, right? And that is still happening uh, today. Um, all voting is local. I was so excited to start working for them because as a person who had worked several presidential and gubernatorial elections here in the state of Ohio, we have a laundry list of problems that happen every single election, and no one is really always working 24-7, 365 days a year to prevent those problems from happening, right? Um, there are uh, a few groups, like the League of Women Voters, that have uh, wonderful volunteers, that have a uh, state uh, executive director. Um, she's got like one and a half other people in her office. <laughs> so, you know, very, very under-resourced, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
But you know that, that oftentimes there isn't a whole lot of um, uh, of uh, infrastructure to help to advocate against these problems that come up every single year and think about them proactively and not just play Monday morning quarterback and say, oh my gosh, yeah, um, you know we have these complaints from a few hundred people in the Akron area who request an absentee ballot, but it took a month for their absentee ballot to get mailed to them. Right? That we can oftentimes work in a proactive way, way before the election happens, to ensure that these problems are fixed before they even become problems. And so that is really the theory of change of working locally to prevent some of these issues. And so working with volunteer groups are, is, is one of the most critical ways that we can do that. Um, some of the other work that I've done beyond the provisional ballot work, um, we uh, specifically help those groups that experience issues getting to the polls. So, uh, for instance, uh, people who have a criminal conviction. Um, does anyone know who who is actually disenfranchised? Is, is anyone disenfranchised in Ohio because of a criminal conviction? If they're still serving time. If they're still serving time, that's the correct answer. The urban myth, though, is that if you have a felony conviction, you cannot vote. And that is not true in the state of Ohio. If you're in jail, if you're on probation, if you're on parole, if you're in a halfway house, you can vote. But that information um, uh, oftentimes is obscured by this idea of, oh, I have a conviction, I can't vote. So we've been doing activist trainings all across the state of Ohio, activating volunteers to go into local jails to assist people who wish to vote, and also working with probation and parole offices and reentry groups to help educate those individuals so that they know that they have the right to vote. Um, in addition, we work a lot with uh, disability rights groups, and this is another group that is oftentimes sort of forgotten about um, in a lot of our civic engagement work. We worked with um, an autism resources group last year to produce a video uh, for people who have a developmental disability to see the voting process from point A all the way to the end. Because for many people who have a developmental disability, there's also a fair amount of sort of social anxiety that comes with it. And so being able to actually see the process unfold helps them to feel more comfortable that they can move forward. So those are the types of proactive things that we're doing, um, in addition to all the work with provisional ballots, absentee ballots, making sure our voter purge lists don't knock off uh, thousands of otherwise eligible voters. Um, so, all Women is Local became interested in a lot of these issues uh, around Election Day because they are so central to making sure that people actually have the right to vote. And what I have found is that the, the, the one thing that oftentimes separates a person from having a good experience in their poll location versus a person who has a not so good experience is having a good poll worker uh, and having enough poll workers. So we're going to talk about some of the threats to having the enough poll workers. But first, I want to talk a little bit about um, who can be a poll worker. How many people here have actually served as a poll worker before? Good. What did you guys? What did you like about the experience of being a poll worker? I did so many years ago. But Yeah. Yeah, but, but but you had a good experience. Oh, yes. Wonderful. Other folks who enjoyed the experience of being poor. I just uh, knowing that I was part of making sure the election was carried out um, properly. Um, we had two options for training: either um, over the internet or uh, at a training session. As a long-time member of the League of Women Voters, I felt good about doing that work. Mm -hmm. It was else? a long day, though. <laughs> Very long day. Okay, you're leading me into the next question, because what are some of the not-so-fun things about being a poll worker? It's a Prim long day. Primary election, when there's so many few voters coming through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's hard to stay awake in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it's 2 o'clock, coming down a little bit and 
there's not a whole lot of people, yeah, it can be, it can be kind of boring, right, in, in a primary election, or even think about some of those off-year elections, right, um, where you have very few voters. I know in Cuyahoga County, in the, in the November election this year, we had record low turnout. We only had just shy of 26% of all registered voters showed up to vote in that election. And so when I walked into my polling location in Cuyahoga County, people were like, oh my gosh, a person, I'm so excited. They were like fighting over me because they wanted something too, right? So it can feel like a very long day. Again, you have to be available from the, about 5:30 in the morning to 8:30 p.m. at night, right? And they say that because you, you know, what's what time are polls open? 6:30. So you got to get there before it opens. You don't want to show up at 6:30 or else you'll get in big trouble with the board of elections, and probably with me too. Uh, so, so you got to be there early to get everything set up and make sure you can open exactly at 6:30, and then. What time do the polls close? 7.30. 7.30. But they say you're probably going to be there until 8.30 because you have to take all the machines down, you got to pack everything up, you got to get everything put away and delivered to the Board of Elections. You also have to stay open as long as there are voters in line. So if there are people in line at 7.30, those folks still get to vote. And we know in some very big elections, I think back to 2004, when we know that there were people who were waiting in line for 11 or 12 hours in order to cast their ballot, that there were some people there very, very late at night in 2004 and could be in the future as well, right? Um, but in terms of being a poll worker, it's not always the most glamorous of jobs, but the benefits are, of course, you get to protect democracy. Uh, you get to see your friends and neighbors, right? Oftentimes you're put into the community where you actually live. Um, the other nice thing is you do get paid, uh, which is nice, right? You get a little bit of money. Um, anybody here a lawyer or a social worker? Wonderful. Social workers. So we're gonna be so we're gonna be sending out some information to local boards of elections that have changed for this year is that local boards of elections for their poll worker trainings now can actually request for free CEU credits for social workers who participate in the trainings. Isn't that exciting? And also free CLE, continuing legal education credits for attorneys, right? So again, these are both groups that are super, super important for us to have in our polling locations because you think, I mean, attorneys at least think that they know everything, right? <laughs> So you want to have people who have maybe some experience with the election, but I also think, you know, as a social worker, it could be really important to have people that have that experience there. Uh, not to put you on the spot, is it uh, Ann? Iris. Iris, sorry. Iris, not to put you on the spot, but how do you think it would be helpful to have some social workers in the polling location on election day? They're used to dealing with marginalized individuals and communities, so if need be, you can run some interference. Mm -hmm. um, they recognize an entirely different uh, group of people at the polls. Um, and I think have the, the wherewithal from their training, our training, and I tell you since their training, um, to explain things so that if somebody doesn't understand the ballot, the what's, what's a provisional ballot, how do I vote, you know, in terms of the mechanism, I think there's a, a level of patience, ideally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Think about, again, we heard Andrew's story at the beginning, right? He had a problem with his ballot, and he had the police call on him. <laughs> that is not necessarily going to leave him feeling all that good about his interaction. And that, you know, social workers are oftentimes trained on how to work interpersonally with people. And so, you know, it can be a real, real benefit to have somebody like that in the room who can assist. Um, oftentimes in-person training, but it can also be online training. It depends on the local board of elections, what they uh, prefer you to do. But oftentimes both are uh, available. Um, now, I took this directly from the Stark County Board of Elections website. They said you must have reliable transportation. <laughs> Um, and, I, and I hear that from a lot. Now, that is not necessarily a requirement that you have to own your own vehicle, right? It's because some people don't have their own vehicle and they might rely on some other type of transportation. The main sort of thing about that is that they want to make sure that you're not 
reliant on somebody else or you have very kind of flaky uh, transportation because what oftentimes happens is, you know, the person's all excited, they're going to work on election day, and then, you know, they wake up at 4 a.m. that morning and their ride doesn't want to get up and they can't get a ride some other way, and how do they get to their polling location? So really what they want to see is that you have some reliable way to be able to get to your polling location on time because it can cause, it can wreak a lot of havoc if you were planning for somebody to be there on election day and then they end up not showing up, right? That could cause a lot of problems with opening up on time. Any questions about those requirements? Good. So we do have some cards in the back um, that I did not put on the front table, but I have them back there um, that actually uh, uh, have information about how to sign up to be a poll worker, so feel free to take those. But basically, you should contact your local board of elections to become a poll worker. Now, why this is all important is because, and, and what sort of spawned a lot of this was to talk was that we wanted to talk about poll worker reduction. So as we mentioned earlier, um, being a poll worker is not always the most like fun and exciting job. <laughs> uh, sometimes it can feel like it's a really long day, you don't get paid all that much, um, it's anywhere between $100 and $150 for the day. Um, and you uh, sometimes have a lot of free time, right? Where there's not a whole bunch of voters coming in, and so you're kind of feeling like, okay, what's going on? And I don't have a whole lot to do, and it can be kind of boring, right? The other side of that is that also when it's really, really busy, um, and you have a million voters waiting in line, is that always the most enjoyable experience either? No, because imagine if you're getting that voter that's been waiting an hour in line and they come up, how was that voter feeling? Right. A little cranky, a little cranky. Um, and then you might have, they might have some sort of issue with their ID or something and you're having to negotiate that. Again, that voter is not necessarily going to be their best self in that moment, right? And you might not be your best self in that moment either. So it can be a stressful job sometimes too. So this past year, uh, the Ohio General Assembly started to uh, the, the process of passing some legislation that would reduce the minimum number of poll workers. Uh, all voting is local and the legal women voters uh, statewide, we led the charge um, against that bill because we feel very, very strongly that you've got to have plenty of poll workers in the polling location. And while I don't love for people to be sitting, feel, sitting idly by and feeling like they're not super busy, I would also say that if they're not you know, running around like crazy and not feeling a lot of stress, then that kind of says that the process is maybe going as it should as well, right? That's actually a sign of health of the election system. We don't want people to feel stressed out and that they're running around like a chicken with their head cut off. Um, so we were uh, pushing uh, to defeat that legislation. Um, we were getting some amendments added to the legislation, and guess what the General Assembly did at the last minute? They did their General Assembly thing that they are so famous for doing. They snuck the provision into the state budget, allowed no debate on it, no discussion, passed it overnight without anybody really noticing until the last minute, and it was, it's in Ohio law now. So, what the poll worker reduction uh, law actually allows for is that uh, boards of elections can reduce the minimum number of poll workers in polling locations that have more than one precinct in them. So, um, if you vote at the uh, Alliance Community Center, right, uh, they might have Alliance uh, Precinct 1A, Alliance Precinct 1B, and Alliance Precinct 3, let's say. So those three precincts all go to that same polling location. Under current law, you have to have a minimum of four poll, poll workers per precinct. So four people. But under the new law, boards of elections can now reduce it to a minimum of just two 
poll workers per precinct. So that means that under that old formula, Alliance Community Center would have 12 poll workers, but now it would be reduced to six. So, can you, so if you have 12 poll workers around you in a, in a low turnout primary election, you think a lot of people might be sitting around? Totally, right? That there may be elections where we can imagine where, you know, there's going to be too many people in the room. But can you also imagine where only six poll workers might not satisfy a polling location with three different precincts? Absolutely. Think ahead to this upcoming year. <laughs> so one thing we can all agree on, uh, uh, I think across the country, is if we can say anything about the 2020 election, the one thing that everybody feels pretty comfortable saying is that there's going to be record-breaking turnout in 2020. With, you know, and and, and it, it's, it's on both the political sides of the aisle, right? Everybody wants to show up on election day to make sure that their voice is heard. And so with record-breaking turnout, that then oftentimes leads to the problems that we see on election day. And so having those poll workers available is so, 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 so critical. So I want to draw your um, attention to a couple of the um, uh, materials that you got. Did everybody get one of these poll worker reduction toolkits? Let me grab a stack of them for folks that might uh, not have grabbed one uh, on their way in. Because we'll be using this also a little bit later. What year did you say that log got snuck in? It was this year. This was yeah, this year. Yeah. Yeah, the, bi the biennial budget process always happens right after, um, in, in odd number of years, usually, and this one was after the gubernatorial election in 2018. So they have to, by state constitution, pass a new budget by June 30th of this year. So they, stuck, they snuck it in at like, you know, June 29th. <laughs> right, right, they did. They did. So in this poll worker reduction uh, handout, we actually have a whole toolkit on what uh, you as an activist may be able to do to help to combat these poll worker reductions. Um, so one of, the, one of the blessings of this law that was passed by the General Assembly, and it was actually a, an artifact from one of the amendments that we had made to the standalone bill. One of the things that we had requested was that uh, you have to have the Board of Elections vote on whether or not they will reduce the number of poll workers in, in each polling location that they have to go, right? So there has to be a vote on the record. That's number one. Number two is that it has to be a majority vote. It can't deadlock at 2-2. Two, two. So it has to be at least 3-1 or 4-0. So that at least allows there to potentially be some bipartisanship in here. Because I can tell you, with boards that deadlock at 2-2, two, two, that happens very, very frequently. Does anyone know what happens if a board of elections deadlocks at 2-2? Two, two? He does. <laughs> and so oftentimes then that gets kicked to the Secretary of State. And we can see then decisions that are not always made in the best interest of voters, but can sometimes be partisan. Right. Um, we saw that back in 2012. And anybody, anybody remember all the fighting over early in-person voting? That, that all started because of deadlocked board votes, where you had boards and elections in big counties like in Summit and Cuyahoga and Franklin, where the, the two Democrats voted to have evening and weekend early in-person voting hours. The two Republicans voted no went over to the uh, uh, Secretary of State, and he broke the tie saying, no, no evening and weekend vote powers. The part that doesn't get reported on quite as much, though, is that then in very in rural and suburban counties, like Butler County and uh, near Cincinnati, which is a um, big Republican stronghold, um, 
they voted for zero to extend the hours. So what was happening in 2012 was all of these urban counties that tend to go more blue were not getting extra hours, and then all of the red counties in the suburban and rural areas were getting extra early voting hours. So that was when litigation had to come in and solve that. So we don't want things to end up being deadlocked and going to the Secretary of State, right? So we want there to be bipartisanship because that also means that we'll have the, hopefully the best interest of the voters in mind, right? So in here, we actually uh, give you some good tips on how to get involved. Because if there has to be an, a, a decision by the election officials, then that means that they're going to have to discuss it at a board of elections meeting. That means that they're going to have to vote on it. And that means that they're going to have to plan for it ahead of time, right? They, they're not just going to think of it the day of and then decide to have a vote. So we give you a couple uh, uh, ideas on how to get started. So we're encouraging local activists, such as the League of Women Voters here, um, to start to uh, investigate what their board of elections is planning to do. Again, we know that the number of poll workers is incredibly important because of turnout, but also because many counties, and we're gonna to get to this in a minute, are also experiencing um, fairly new technology. And that that new technology, one, causes problems with poll workers who just might not be as familiar with it, but number two, with the voters themselves. You know, if I'm used to voting on one type of machine and then suddenly it changes to something completely different, I'm going to have a hard time whether or not that machine is working correctly or not, right? Um, so we want to make sure that there are plenty of poll, uh, poll workers. So on here, it gives you a couple uh, beginning uh, steps. So one is attending a board of elections meeting. How many of us have ever attended a board of elections meeting? Oh, I'm so excited. What, what, what's a board of elections meeting like? Tell me. Pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> what? Boring? The most exciting thing was that the roof was leaking. <laughs> <laughs> that is exciting, yeah. actually. Yeah. It later fell in. That's really, that, this was, this was Stark, or, yeah. oh wow, that's, that's very exciting. Yeah. I went to one once where they actually had flooding in the basement, oh. and the, the Board of Elections director, she had to jump down in the basement, swim and grab all the, oh. you know, uh, oh uh, USB stuff, and yeah. that was crazy. Um, but very interesting, but, but for the most part, it's not super exciting, right? What are some of the things you've heard them talk about the Board of Elections? The roof leaking. The roof leaking. <laughs> that was the, at that time. That was the big issue with the, uh, you know, <clears throat> protection of the equipment. And, um, I subsequently did. Move. Yeah, they had eventually moved. But they, I mean, it was everybody was very cordial. I was felt welcome. There was no tension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about for you, Iris? What was your experience like? I went when they were. Um, making a decision about which provisional ballots to accept. Mm -hmm. And what was fascinating to me is that all of them worked really hard to figure out how to accept every provision. Mm -hmm. I think there were maybe one or two that it was pretty obvious should not have been accepted. Yeah. Um, but the others, they tied themselves in knots to accept. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with Franklin County, I mentioned, you know, they have problems with provisional ballots and the signature mismatch, but I happened to go after our report came out, there had just been an election there, and, or no, it wasn't an election, it was a petition that they were, that they were certifying for an election, and they were doing signature mismatches right there, and I saw how they were struggling to try and match some of these signatures, so it gave me a new appreciation for the process. Mm -hmm. Were there, you know, dozens of other activists who were there to watch the, the meeting? No, it was me. No. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you, you are oftentimes, if you decide to go to a board of elections meeting, you're like kind of like a celebrity because they're like, oh my gosh, uh, 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 an actual citizen cares about our elections. This is exciting. Like, they actually really appreciate that there are people there. I've always found, you know, sometimes people feel like, ooh, are they going to be, you know, grouchy at me? Are they going to treat me weird if I show up? And every time I've gone, people have been so excited that somebody is there because they oftentimes kind of feel like they're toiling away and no one really knows all of the really good work that they're doing and all the things that they're having to do to plan for um, election day. 
So don't, so, so the moral of the story is don't be scared, right? And when you go, know that um, they want they want to be friends with you, right? When they have a committed uh, uh, public uh, servant who is there who wants to be engaged with the elections and you tell them you're from the League of Women Voters, League of Women Voters is a hundred year old uh, amazing uh, voting, voter rights organization that has some cachet with it, right? Where those election officials will take you seriously and they will say, wow, you know, you're from the League, you all have been doing this in a nonpartisan way for over a hundred years, I want to be able to work with you, right? And so it can be really, really powerful to be there. And there's a couple reasons why it's important to be there. So number one, well, let, let's actually, I, I, I won't tell you the answers. We'll see if we, we can get them. So why, why do you think it's important to have people in the room when the decisions are being made? To hold them accountable. To hold them accountable, right? Um, and part of that is, so part of accountability is also transparency. As I said, most of these meetings, I'm so glad the two of you attended, but most of them, they have almost no one who comes to them. And so a lot of these decisions are sort of being made in the dark. Maybe they'll put, they, they post their minutes or something on their website. Guess how many people probably go and download the minutes from the website, right? Not a whole lot. And so there isn't so much information coming out. So with that transparency that you can provide, there's also accountability to hold them accountable, right? The other side of it is, is that sometimes you can discover a problem that people didn't know existed until you were actually there, right? You can uncover something that no one actually imagined was going to even be a problem. One example from um, the 2018 election, um, probably a lot of you paid attention to uh, the state of Georgia, right? And all of the issues that were going on in Georgia, yes. Well, if you recall, leading up to, to the election, there was a story that came out about um, some polling places that were closed down and were moved uh, further north, about 20 miles north. That decision was supposedly because the current polling locations were not ADA accessible, right? So of course we want our polling locations to be ADA accessible. But you know what's not accessible to people uh, with disabilities? How do you drive 20 miles more, right? <laughs> or get on a bus to get 20 miles more, right? right. So you know, there's also uh, an accessibility piece of that as well. But it, people only found out about that change because there were local activists uh, in Georgia who attended that Board of Elections meeting, and the election officials announced at that meeting, oh yeah, we're going to be changing these polling locations. There were no reporters in the room. No one would have picked up that this was an issue until election day actually happened. And so by you all going to the Board of Elections meetings, you're going to be able to uncover potential issues that might be coming up. And poll worker reductions could be one of them, right? When you get to the Board of Elections meeting, you know, you want to go introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Mike. I'm with the League of Women Voters, and I'm here to just observe and um, choose, make friends with them, right? Um, you can also, while when you meet with them, you can say, hey, I'm really interested in uh, this issue of poll worker reductions. I'd love to set up a meeting or a coffee with you at some point. Have a meeting with them, right? Talk to them about your concerns. In this uh, uh, election official uh, 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 materials, it gives you some information and some sample questions that if you were to meet with an election official, what are some questions you can ask in regard to poll worker reductions, right? So asking things like, are you considering reducing any poll workers? I can tell you, I personally have already had two of these meetings with Cuyahoga and Franklin County Board of Elections. And our questions were, are you guys planning to reduce your poll workers in 2020? And they both said, absolutely not. We need all the poll workers we can get in 2020. So that ended the conversation pretty quickly, but then it spun into other questions of how can we help you to recruit those poll workers, right? Which is something that you can do that I think is really kind of a next level strategy because you don't want to just go in and start yelling at the election officials and shaking your finger at them. I mean, I don't discourage that either. <laughs> 
But it's also helpful if you can be there and be part of the solution, right? To say, how we know being a poll worker is not the most exciting, glamorous job in the world. How can we help you to recruit more people? So we give you a list of potential uh, questions to ask, right? Now, there are lots of ways that these meetings or these initial go into the Board of Elections could go, right? Um, how many of us have ever been in a meeting where you had a dialogue with somebody and you didn't quite feel like they were telling you the whole truth? <laughs> So there, th th there's this idea of sometimes we've got to double check to make sure what is actually ha what, what they're actually saying is really the truth, right? And so sometimes you need to produce something in black and white that's actually going to say that. So we also give one a sample letter to election officials that you can write them, um, that you can use to introduce yourself. So also if you don't have time to go to an election official meeting, or maybe it's on a day or an evening or during the work day, you just can't physically get there. This letter here gives you a good uh, set of language to make an initial uh, uh, introduction to the election official. But we also have a sample public records request. Anybody here ever submit a public records request? Uh, you, you're, you guys are like warming my heart. Who did you submit a public records request to? It was to uh, the Justice Department. Oh. Justice Department. Right? Going right to the top. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes, I don't know if I would do that now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, you would just say, uh, you would know if it was true what they said. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. I had an issue and, you know. You had to go through the whole FOIA right. request process. Yeah, right. says so the Justice Department is bound by something that we call FOIAs, which is the Freedom of Information Act. It's federal law that requires certain things to be made public. I saw back there you also did a public records request. Who did you do one to? The State Board of Education. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. What was, what was it like doing that? Well, I held my breath a long time. Before I did it, I was currently employed as a public school teacher. Okay, yeah. So there's a little bit of like, oh gosh, this is going to be a little scary, right? Oh no. Um, but did, did you get a response? Yes, I did. And you got what you needed, more or less. <laughs> more or less. Yeah. So this this is a really good point. So I personally have probably done, I don't know, a thousand records requests in my, in my activist lifespan. Asking for a range of things. Um, you know, I, I mentioned before I worked for the ACLU, one of the first records requests I did, um, we did a big investigation in the early 2010s around um, contemporary debtors' prisons, right? These are when people owe fines and fees to the criminal justice system, and the judge says, okay, you owe $500, you have to pay the entire $500 by Friday. If you don't, then you're going to jail and we had people in Ohio who were being sent to jail. The interesting thing is that once you were sent to jail, what happened to your debt? Oh, well you got another $500, and then interest on that, and it suddenly compounded. So we were meeting people who owed fines when it started at $500, and suddenly it was $5,000, so that they had spent weeks and weeks and weeks in jail. And so we had to do records requests to jails to find out who's in your jail, why are they there, what, what led to this person being there, how long were they there, where did they come from, which court sent them there, because even, I imagine in Stark County, there's more than one court in the entire county, right? I know Alliance Municipal Court has, has a court, Canton, I'm sure, has one, there are probably other ones. Don't even get me started on mayor's courts. I'm sure you have a few of those around here, too. Um, so there can be different courts, right? And so we had to use public records requests to start to understand the problem. You can do the same thing here, right? Where you, and with public records requests, if there's state law that says any person can request documents from a government official. We have that in place for exactly what this lady back here said because when we know what the documents say that is what helps hold up them to account right when we know that uh, they don't have plans to recruit poll workers or we know that 
they were aware that the roof was leaking and dripping onto all of the election machines and that half of them were malfunctioning and that they didn't let anybody in the public know about that ahead of time. Those documents can oftentimes under, can help uh, uncover those things. And if you ever watched one of those movies like, you know, Aaron Brockovich or whatever, I mean, you, you are literally that activist who is going and finding out what's really going on. Um, we have a sample records request on, uh, on pull, uh, pull worker reductions in that material. So you can take that verbatim, word for word, and you can submit it. You don't have to be an attorney. You don't have to be you know, an elected official. Any person in this state or any other state can submit one of these public records requests and get this information. Yeah. That about three quarters of the way down, it says including FTP transfer, what does that mean? Yes, yeah, so, and you don't have to use it if you don't want, but FTP means a, it's like an electronic transfer of records. So essentially it means that how a lot of board, boards of elections or government agencies send stuff is they'll send you like a copy of the paper in the uh, mail. Um, some places, though, want to send you a disk. Some places will send you, you know, a flash drive. FTP just means that it is a secure website that they oftentimes set up that you can just download the, the documents directly from that website. It just saves time and energy a lot of the time because then you don't have to wait for the mail to get the, uh, delivered to you. You can do it right away, and it actually makes their system easier, too. So that, that's all it means. It's just a, a, a a website that the government entity creates that you can download. The yeah, it's, a, it's an acronym for file transfer protocol. Yeah. Like when we go to the BOE to request our voter lists, that's that's the process they usually use. And instead of giving you paper, they give you uh, this. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. Thank you. So. I, I heard from back here when you did your pu public records request to the State Board of Education that you got most of what you want. So I also want to say here that you, as an activist, also um, that, that you're kind of in the driver's seat of this negotiation, right? What you write in this public records request are the things that you're asking for initially. Now, a Board of Elections could come back to you and say, oh, we don't have any of those records. They don't exist. Is that always true? <laughs> not necessarily. Why not necessarily? Well, I'm just saying, I think it's a different situation. I used to get told a lot from the registrar at the university where I worked. He didn't have that information. He didn't know the statistics. He didn't know the stats like your registrar or something like that. And they don't want to give you something. They don't want to give for it because they want to give you this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've had it where, so like, let's go back to the jail uh, booking list, right? So I would ask for, give me a list of everybody in your uh, facility and the reason that they're there. So some jails would respond to me and they would say, oh, we don't have a list of people in our jail. Which I'm like, you don't know who's in your jail? One, if that's true, I'm even more concerned than I was before, right? Because you should know who's in your jail. That's kind of important. That's like, that's like step one in running the jail, so no one who's there. So when I talked to them, then they said, oh, well, we said we didn't have any records because we don't have records that show both the name of the person and the reason that they're, that they're there. In our system, we don't keep track of the reason. And so then we're just not going to give you any information. Well, it's supposed to be the duty of the government official to let you know those things and start to negotiate and say, oh, well, we don't have a list that has both of those things, but we have two separate lists that have each of those things separately. Would that be OK? Yes, that would be perfectly fine, right? So oftentimes, if you get a response where you don't get everything that you wanted in your first question, it, you, you go back and you say, well, why, why don't you have this information? Um, we, yeah. I was just going to say, were those publicly run jails or subcontracted or both? They were all publicly run. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and shouldn't we be able to expect 
that they follow for you even if they're subcontracted? Many times, yeah. Um, I, I will say, like, I personally dealt with, um, so jails are different than prisons. We don't have any privately run jails in Ohio, okay. um, but we do have private prisons. And okay. so in Conneaut, uh, in Ashtabula County, and then also there was one in Lorain County when I was working on that, we would do records requests to the private prison agencies and that they were supposed to turn over the information. Um, you should not run into that here in uh, the uh, election sphere around boards of elections. Those are all, you know, 100% government agencies. Um, but you will run into this, oh, well, we don't have that information. Um, another example, recently I just did records requests. Stark County did very well. They complied 100%. So you should all feel good about that. Um, but I did records requests around vote by mail. Um, so we're trying to get an understanding of, uh, we're seeing large numbers of people who have their votes uh, discarded um, for some technical reasons. So for things like signature mismatch, uh, for things like um, they inverted their birth date on their uh, absentee ballot identification envelope, or they put the, at the current day rather than their date of birth, things like that. So we're trying to understand what, where, where those problems are arising and why, um, because different counties look very, very different. And so we did a request of like 15 different counties around the state just to kind of understand the issue. And very similarly, I got this response of, oh, well, we have, you know, one list of the date of birth people here, one list of the signature match people over here, another list of the people that just, their stuff got here late over here. And even though I asked for all three on one list, they didn't have it all on one list, but they did have it on three separate lists. So that was a negotiation piece that I had to do with the Board of Elections to say, okay, so I understand you have these three separate lists. I'll just take all, all three of the lists, give me what you got, and I'll put this stuff together. So you might get a response like that. But doing a public records request can be a really good way to get information. Now, in terms of what is a public record, so what are some examples of things that could be public records? And if you already read, read it up, up on the records request the fair, you should see some of that, but Iris? Minutes of meetings. Minutes of meetings. So you can see how poll worker reductions have been discussed in any meetings that I didn't attend, right? You can get that. What else? Financial statements. Absolutely, any financial statements. So maybe they slash their poll worker training or their fund to pay poll workers. That might be a good indicator of whether or not they're planning on cutting uh, poll workers this election, right? What else? Allocation of voting machines per polling location. Absolutely. So there, and we're going to talk about in a minute, their election administration plans. And that goes to any other planning document they have. So like, if they have a list, of, a staffing list of where they're going to put poll workers all across the county, that's a public record, right? They, they need to provide that to you. In addition, emails, any written uh, uh, communication is also a public record. Um, so if, if Board of Elections members are emailing each other saying, yeah, I think we're going to cut poll workers this year, can I count on your vote, or whatever, those communications are public record as well, and you're entitled to them, right? So in, in the sample public records request, we actually give you a lot of that language of what types of things you're asking. Okay, so we've submitted the public records request, maybe we've met with the Board of Elections, and we hear the Board of Elections has told us we're going to cut poll workers across the county, uh, we're going to go in every single multiple polling location, multiple precinct polling location, we're going to cut to the minimum of two people per county, or per, 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 per precinct. And um, you try to negotiate with the person, uh, the, the director of the board of elections, he or she has said, nope, no dice, this is what we're doing, we've decided we're going forward. So we then give you some ideas of things that you can do to start to advocate, because it's that decision at the end of the discussion. No, it isn't, right? So what are some things that we can do after we get that no from that elected official or election official? 
Oh, yeah. And I'm sorry, but you League of Women Voters members are like the best at stirring up a rest of our ruckus. <laughs> you are A plus. So yes, yeah, stirring up a ruckus. Let's let's take that apart a little bit more. How do we stir up that ruckus? Letter to the editor. Do a letter to the editor, which we have a sample one in this package that you are free to crib from and use whatever language you want, right? So writing something to the, the, the letter to the editor. What else? Give access to local radio or TV. So remember how Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Remember how I said nobody comes to board of elections meetings? So I would be willing to bet, oh, we might have a blogger here who might want to co cover something that's going on. Or, you know, has anyone talked to the camp repository? Has anyone talked to the radio stations, right? Remember, you as League of Women super volunteers have some power here where you can reach out and start to say, hey, did you hear about this problem? I guarantee you, while you may not have a whole lot of reporters just right this minute who are all wanting to cover the election beat, mm -hmm. guess what's going to happen starting around March of next year? Mm -hmm. it, it is going to be uh, pe people, it, it's going to be chaos, right? And, it's gonna, and, and, and that chaos can work in our favor in that reporters want to hear from election advocates. And you all being League of Women Voter volunteers, have a cachet, have a credibility that I think can really help to speak to this issue. And so don't be afraid to go to the media. Don't be afraid to put it onto social media, right? These things can become um, uh, uh, you know, major pieces. I, I hope that you would all contact me if you hear about the poll worker reductions in your community, because we can help to set up an action alert for people to write in directly to their board of elections director here in Stark County to say, we don't want you to reduce these polling locations, uh, these poll workers in these polling locations, right? So there are ways we can build advocacy. Another go oh, yeah. Oh, I have more of a question. Yeah, please. You want me to say it? Please, no. So, um, what would be, and uh, is there a possible unexpected consequence to us insisting that the polls have to have, say, four workers, and if they are not able to recruit all four, does that whole place then get closed and not, are you know, we going to end up? reducing the number of possible polling places? So, great question. And, and no, that you would not have polling locations be closed uh, because they were unable to recruit. But I, so one part of that is when you're having these conversations, this is why it's important to, once you understand what is their plan for poll worker reductions, also understanding what is their plan for poll worker recruitment, right? So if they are struggling with getting some of these poll workers, it's about also then saying, how can we, the league, or our other community groups, our other coalition partners who might be standing here, help to provide more people and help to publicize this opportunity? Um, one example I can give you uh, from uh, 2018, um, so we worked very closely with the Cuyahoga County Board of Elections. Now, the need for poll workers is pretty much universal across every county, but I would say it looks different depending on the county that you're in. So in Cuyahoga County, guess who they need number one most of for poll workers? Republicans. They are desperate for Republicans because they have and, and actually, they do need some Democrats more on like the southwest part of the county, where there's a higher Republican rate. But many of the Republicans who live there won't travel to like the far east side, where they have just a glut of Democrats. And so, speaking to the Board of Elections, they were in the weeks before the election, they were like, "We're really worried. We're not going to be able to recruit enough Republicans." So we actually were able to drum up some. Uh, Media, we were on WTAM, which is our talk radio uh, uh, program in Greater Cleveland, talking about the need for poll workers. When we did that, they were getting 20 applications a day from uh, Republicans who said, We had no idea that you needed poll workers. No one had advertised this to us before. We want to be poll workers. They actually reported that year. It was the first year um, that they, in, in recent memory, that they were actually able to have that partisan, that bipartisan balance in every single polling location across the county. 
a lot of times what they do is they have to backfill with actual people from who are like permanent Board of Elections uh, members to go out into the field. They didn't have to do, to do that in 2018 because we recruited there. So opening up and talking about that recruitment can be important as well. Uh, it seems to be a few years ago, uh, it was pretty common for there to be um, some polling locations closed. Yes. And if that happens, do they have to try to maintain equal amounts of voters in each precinct? Great question. What's the, what are, what are the rules and in fact, that's our, that's our next thing because oh. as you see that, I, it's like I planted her in the audience here. <laughs> Because, 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 um, if you are having this conversation with this election official, right, if you, if you get a sit down with the Stark County Board of Elections Director, I mean, that's amazing, right? That's a great opportunity. You should be prepared to talk about other important things other than just poll worker reductions and recruitment, right? That's an important topic. But if they say, oh yeah, if it goes like my meeting did with Kylo and Franklin, where they're like, yeah, we're not cutting anything, and you get to that in the first 30 seconds of the meeting, then you might have other issues that you want to talk about. And so polling location changes and closures are uh, the number one issue that we get reported from election protection. Um, in 2018, we did election protection here in Northeast Ohio with the Cleveland branch of the NAACP, and we were inundated with calls from people in Cuyahoga County who said, I went to where I usually go to vote. I'm, not, I'm apparently not supposed to vote there anymore. I don't know where I'm going, right? So when a polling location is changed, what does the Board of Election have to do to let the voter know that it changed? Send out a postcard. Send out a postcard. That's right. But here's the interesting thing about that is they are only required to send out that postcard in the election that the change happened. So let me tell you how the changes oftentimes happen. So I want every single voter in you know, the state of Ohio and the United States, frankly, to vote every single election, right? Like I, of course I want you to vote every single election. But let's be honest, there are some voters who only show up in presidential election years. There are some voters who only show up once every two years, right? So there are some that are four years, some that are two years. So let's say you are that typical four-year voter, right? You only vote in presidential elections. So you last showed up in 2016, November. You voted at the um, Alliance uh, Community Center, right? No problem, cash your ballot, all was well. You didn't move, but in the interim, uh, they, uh, they moved one of the precincts in 2017, the primary of May, primary of 2017, they moved your precinct to Mount Union College. So now you're voting at Mount Union. Uh, well, you get a postcard in April of 2017 to let you know that May primary, your location has moved. Do you get a postcard in 2018? Do you get a postcard in 2019? Do you get a postcard in 2020? No. And so you, the one every, once every four-year voter, you might have gotten that postcard three and a half years ago, but you haven't thought about it since then, and you're just planning to show up to the place that you know, oh, I've been voting there for years and years and years. And so suddenly there's this change, right? And so for many voters, they don't always know about these polling location changes. Sometimes there are situations that happen where polling locations change more frequently. Do you and, and can, do you guys have a lot of um, St. Patrick's Day celebrations? We sure do in Cleveland. And guess when our primary is next year? So let me tell you. We have we have in the in, in the United States. Cleveland is host to the second largest parade of any city for St. Patrick's Day in the United States. It's the second largest parade. It shuts down most of downtown, a whole big portion of the west side of Cleveland as well. So there are, and we've been talking about the Board of Elections, there are two polling locations that are right smack dab in the middle of the parade. So you're just going to have to close those down. There's no way you can have voting. 
So what do those voters do who are trying to get to their new polling location that might be five miles away because that's the closest that they can get that's outside of the parade route? And what if they don't have a you know, car and they're using the RTA? What if they uh, have a disability? What, you know, all of these issues, right? But it's even worse than that because then if you look at the rest of the county, so even if you're not in the parade route, well, what are, what are some typical places that are used as polling locations? Churches. Churches, schools, DFW halls, KFC halls, that's all kids do, right? Stuff like that, right, that are ADA accessible, that are big community places. So a lot of those places have St. Patrick's Day festivals, have St. Patrick's Day, Day brunches. So we are hearing from nearly every single community in Cuyahoga County that there's going to be a polling location change in March because these churches and these community groups are saying, we can't host you. We, we can't do voting that day because there could be a bunch of drunk people that are going to be drinking <laughs> great beer and eating eggs and they're not going to want to, you know, uh, do, we're not going to want to do voting. And so many of those locations might have a change for March and then another change in November. And when you think about multiple changes in a single calendar year, that has the potential to also confuse and throw off voters. And so asking them, what are your plans for polling location changes? And then the second question is, what are your plans to educate those voters about those changes? So one thing that actually I'm very proud of that we do in Cuyahoga County is that they do send those postcards every single election to every single voter. So they get a postcard every election saying where their polling location is. But in addition, we we're starting to talk with the Board of Elections. We're like, OK, we're going to do some canvassing in those areas. We have the ability to find phone numbers of folks who live there. So we're going to call them. We're going to text them. We're going to let them know about these changes, right? So being able to have more information ahead of time allows you to better uh, help the Board of Elections to uh, publicize those changes when they do happen. There can sometimes be those emergency things, right, where a polling location is closed down on an emergency basis. Again, having that relationship with the Board of Elections is important to be able to get that information earlier and it helps to disseminate that to your community. Um, there are requirements in terms of like, you know, if you're if you are closing down polling locations, um, you do want to keep like a certain number of voters in each place in terms of likelihood of turnout and everything. So they have whole sort of calculations that boards of election long times look at. For that. So they like no more than five or ten percent deviation in size. They they try and look at those things again. It's hard to always know because. They do, they do look at some historical turnout and stuff that's sometimes hard to, to predict, right? And that's oftentimes, again, where we can run into problems, too, because, like, we're all trying to predict 2020. Can anyone here predict what's actually going to happen? <laughs> Other than there's a whole lot of people that are going to show up, right? I don't actually know what the numbers are and where that's going to be, right? And so a lot of it can be a guessing game. And so that's why it's important for them to do their planning. Um, that actually brings me to, um, I'm going to skip ahead. Well, we do have, I'm going to get back to voting equipment, but I want to get to the election administration plans. Because that actually gets to what they are doing to make sure that things actually work the way that they are supposed to. And this is something, if you're meeting with an election official, you should ask to see their election administration plans. These are required that people have to do every single election. And as I said when we opened up, the League of Women Voters gets 100% credit for devising these. Um, these are really, here in Ohio, something you all did. And I will tell you, they are the envy of voter advocates across the nation. I have counterparts in Arizona and Wisconsin and uh, Pennsylvania who are like, oh, I wish we could have these in our state, and they don't. I think they came about as a result of a, a legal action. That's right. And that's soon going to fall off as a requirement. It already has, actually. Oh. So here, here's the here's the whole scoop about this. So election administration plans came about 
after the 2004 election, and we already talked about how chaotic and frankly awful the 2004 election was. Um, again, I remember there were students, the, the one that is always talked about are the students at Kenyon College in Gambier, Ohio, who waited literally 12 hours in line to vote. Um, yeah, 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 I'm not, I'm not discounting. Um, so they, they, they waited that long, but there were people all across the state where we doc, where the League of Women Voters documented across the state that there were many, many places where people waited 12 hours, but also less than that, and they waited six hours or four hours or three hours. Those are all a problem, right? Generally, uh, election officials want you to wait no more than 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, that's when people start to get pretty impatient, right? So the whole voting experience, ideally, should be no more than 30 minutes. The League of Women Voters found that people were waiting way, way, way in excess of that. Um, so they filed suit uh, after the 2004 election. They filed a lawsuit in federal court. Uh, the state eventually settled that lawsuit. And one of the things that they got from it what were election administration plans. And if you go to the Ohio Secretary of State's website, they actually have a format for election administration plans. They literally ask like a hundred different questions about every single thing that you have to plan for for election day. So how many poll workers are you gonna have? What, what are your plans for poll worker recruitment? What are the number of machines that you're gonna have in each polling location? Uh, where are your polling locations going to be? But also, what are your emergency plans? So what happens when things don't go as you expected? And let me give a couple examples of that, just from 2018, right? So in 2018, I mentioned I did uh, uh, election protection with the NAACP here in Northeast Ohio. So we were getting calls from counties all across Northeast Ohio. So some of the emergency things that we saw, uh, in Cuyahoga County, we got a call from a uh, board of elections, or from a voter who said, I'm trying to go vote in my polling location at the school, and I use a wheelchair, and the door is locked that is accessible for people with wheelchairs. <laughs> oh no, that is a problem, so we call the board of elections, and as we're talking to the board of elections, we can hear the poll worker uh, talking to the voter and saying, you know, this happens every single election. They always forget to contact the, uh, the person who manages the school to unlock this door, and I don't know why no one's you know, fixed this after three or four years. That's something that could and should be addressed by your election administration plan, you know, making sure you're reaching out and ensuring all of the accessible doorways are open and ready to go, right? But another example, uh, if you remember in November of 2018 on election day, there was bad weather that night. There were tornadoes in Mahoning and Trumbull counties. And in Trumbull County in particular, they lost power. So what do you do when you don't have power and you're using those fancy electronic pull books and you have maybe a DRE touchscreen machine or you have a scanner that you're feeding your paper ballots into? What do you do? Uh, other than pray, uh, <laughs> your, your election administration plan has a plan for that, of what the poll workers are trained to do if something like that happens. And so they, they followed that plan, that they had enough battery power for X number of hours. If it wasn't fixed by then, they had an order for paper ballots to come, that they were switching paper ballots and paper uh, 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 poll books. Um, so they had a plan, and they followed it, and Trouble County turned out to be gone. Another problem is, we love the technology, but does the technology always work? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so another example, in Hamilton County, in Cincinnati, we were getting calls from people. They had new um, machines in 2018, and the machines were programmed so they had paper ballots that they were sticking into a scanner. If you undervoted, which means you did not cast a ballot in a race, so you know a lot of a lot of people choose not to vote on a particular race because maybe they don't like any of the candidates, maybe they don't know enough about the candidates, whatever. So you can choose to undervote, and maybe they just want to vote in the governor's race or on a specific tax levy or something like that. So when people did that, 
The machine was misprogrammed, so it came up with this message that basically told the voter that their ballot was going to be rejected. And so this caused mass confusion and panic throughout all of the precincts in Hamilton County, where people that we were, we were calling the Board of Elections, they were having to come up with an emergency plan to get around that programming in the electronic machines. But that that was also covered in their election administration. Another example, Geauga County, uh, just north of here, uh, we started to get calls on election day from people who said, you know, when I went to go vote, that electronic poll machine, it told me that I already requested an absentee ballot and I did not request an absentee ballot, but they made me vote a provisional ballot. Well, once we got like, you know, five of those calls, we were like, what's going on in Java County? So we called down there and they're like, and the Board of Elections is like, yeah, we're starting to hear that too. We're getting a lot of calls. We don't know what's going on either. We'll come to find out somebody had misprogrammed the electronic poll books and added about 3,000 people into the poll book saying that they had requested an absentee ballot when they had not. And so again, in the election administration plan, they had a plan that if there was a misprogramming or something wrong with the electronic poll books, what the procedure was to get the fix out to every single polling location across Geauga County. And so they implemented that. So again, all of those examples are things that are like, those things shouldn't happen, and how can we plan on them happening? You can't, other than you have to plan for the unexpected. You have to expect the unexpected. And so having the election administration plan is incredibly, incredibly important. A lot of election officials, when this first came about in like 2006, they were like, oh, do we have to do the election administration plans? Because it's, you know, pages and pages and pages of writing. I will tell you, talking to most election officials across the state, they are so happy to do this. That they love this because it makes them, it forces them to plan, and it makes them think through stuff and they've come to appreciate it. So as was uh, previewed, that uh, uh, settlement agreement was good for 10 years. So it's been 10 years. The settlement agreement has expired. Since then, the Secretary of State now requires boards of elections to do it by directive. So he has said, you must continue to do this. But that is the only thing that's really requiring boards of elections to do this. We, the League of Women Voters, have been pushing very, very hard to have election administration plans. And in fact, that was actually one of the things that we were negotiating on on the poll worker reduction bill to say, you can't reduce uh, your number of poll workers unless you do the math in your election administration plans and show your work, right? So this is a gold mine for you to know what exactly your board of election is planning. And so asking for that way ahead of time Oftentimes they're planning these out a couple months before the election, so they're going to have their election administration plans done uh, ahead of time. Asking for it as soon as you possibly can can give you so much information about what that board of election is planning on doing. So I have a question. Yes. Those, aren't, those are not available electronically on the website. It is just accessible through the Board of Education. Yeah, you, yeah usually, usually not. So the Secretary of State does a pretty good job of putting them up after the fact, <laughs> but not such a good job of putting them together beforehand. So those are really best uh, uh, received through a public records request. Thank you. Yep. Other questions about the election administration plan? So I want to make sure we talk then about the other thing that we're really hoping for there to be assistance on. And uh, we wrote down a few things uh, here in terms of stuff that you can do. Um, so you know, meetings of decision makers, letters to the editor, contacting elected officials, public events, spreading word. But also, there's election protection. So with any of this, you know, whatever you do to help to plan for, you know, potential poll worker reductions, uh, any kind of um, issues with machines and allocations of machines or movements of uh, polling locations. So you can do all of that planning ahead of time, but then what happens on the day of the election? And I can tell you election protection is one of the really, really great ways to help voters in real time 
when they experience those problems on the ground. Um, I will tell you that uh, in 2018, we were able to identify so many different issues that came up, and we were able to help voter, voters who otherwise would not have been able to, to cast it out. And we heard uh, from one person, who said that they did election protection here, you did, right? Has anyone else ever done election protection? No. And you did it back in 2004, it was here in Stark County? Yes. Was it through, was it not partisan or was it through a political party? It was partisan. Okay. So I want to make sure that we understand what the difference is here. Because there is so-called election protection that can happen or poll monitoring that can happen through partisan means. So oftentimes, uh, you will have poll monitors who are appointed by either a political candidate a political party, or I see we have a few petition uh, uh, circulators here, if an issue is on the ballot, so for instance, if this if, if, if a gun safety initiative gets on the ballot, representatives from that gun safety initiative could say, we want to have poll monitors in the polling locations to monitor what happens at, the, at these specific locations. Similarly, some people, um, if you have like a school levy, they'll sometimes have people from the school levies, or you know any other issue that could be on the ballot. But those are people that have to be appointed by those campaigns. They are given formal paperwork, and they are allowed inside the polling location to observe. And I say to observe, right? You as a poll monitor are not allowed to say, oh, Donna, let me, you're trying to vote. Let me come interject myself into your experience over here and maybe help you know, influence you in some way of how I want you to vote, right? They are not allowed to do anything like that. They are there to observe. If they see something going on that is not good, they can get on the phone and call their people and start to address those issues. Yeah. yeah I, I hit a, a election protection program in Massachusetts where Hispanic people were being disenfranchised. And in one area of the state, and what we did it took over a year and a half. We went into the neighborhoods and first we registered them and we had Spanish students. And then we stayed in touch with them on a regular basis until voting day. Mm -hmm. And so that they could find their voice around the issues. I was the <coughs> poll monitor at one of the polling locations then. Yep. And I couldn't believe my eyes on it. Yeah. Um, we had escorts that would bring these people in that could only speak Spanish. And I couldn't believe it when they were brought up to the registration table the people at the table would actually turn their backs on them. And they didn't know how to advocate for themselves to even check in. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, you know, uh, a rampant disenfranchisement of these people through the, the business processes at the polling, polling locations. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. it, it, it can help to give you a glimpse inside the sausage making of democracy, right? right. What's, act, what's actually happening. Now, those partisan or campaign-affiliated uh, poll monitors, that is different than non-partisan election protection. So what I am talking about here, the 1-866-R vote number, that is non-partisan. It is administered by the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law, big national organization, I think RFK started them back in the uh, 50s and 60s, but they actually helped to draft the Voting Rights Act back in 1964. Five very very um, you know well known uh, organization that has done voting rights work for decades and decades. They're strictly nonpartisan. They administer the program across the country, but then rely on local organizations such as the League of Women Voters or All Voting Is Local or Common Cause or NAACP to help to actually make the program into reality. And so what we do then is that we plan to have poll monitors outside of polling locations. So since we are nonpartisan, we're not like appointed by any government official, we stand outside of the polling locations and assist voters there. Now, some people, when I tell them, oh, you're outside of the polling location, they get really disappointed. They're like, oh, but I want to be inside in the action. Um, let me tell you, I actually, ha having done election protection for a number of years, I love being outside. Um, 
I don't love being outside for the weather, because it's Ohio. <laughs> but I do love being outside because I actually find it can be very, it can actually be much more effective for the voter. So first of all, I get to see that voter when they first walk up to the polling location. And so I get to have that first contact with that voter. Now imagine we're in election year 2020, and the line to vote is really long, and it's an hour long wait. So if that voter has to stand in line for an hour, and then they get to the front of the voting line, and the poll worker says, oh no, you're in the wrong location, what's that voter gonna do? Go home and eat, right? <laughs> they're, 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 and they're gonna be frustrated, they're gonna feel like they were disenfranchised, and you know the other thing is if if they don't go home and eat, they also might insist, okay, well I'm just gonna vote provisional. Well, is a provisional ballot cast in the wrong location counted? No, it is rejected, it is thrown out. And so that voter, one way or another, is then more likely to lose their vote either by not going to their correct polling location or by casting a provisional ballot in the wrong location. Yeah. I have a question about the signature. I heard you talk about it a little bit earlier.